Hello and welcome to Your Questions Answered with Father Gruner. I'm John Veneri. In this program, we take the questions that you send us and Father Gruner answers, and we talk about them, we have discussions. So continue to send us these questions, please, at questions at thefatimacenter.com. Here's a question, and we get asked this rather often, actually. Um, I question the truth coming from today's Vatican because I feel that we are getting selective truth from them. Fatima is the example, is an example. They delayed revealing the third secret, and the secret they did release is not the secret that our Blessed Mother dictated. Because of this, how do I know when I need to stay faithful to the edicts of the Church, and where can I trust them? Well, very interesting question, and of course, uh, I suppose the question doesn't occur to me, because, uh, but it's a valid question, don't get me wrong. The first thing is that if you know what the Church has taught, and, the, and so let's go, go back a little bit and say, okay, why do we believe the church, because the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Why do we believe the faith? Because it's the truth. How do we know it's the truth? Because God revealed it. God who revealed it can't be mistaken because he knows everything, and he can't be lying to us because he's all-knowing. So what God tells us is the truth. What the church, the pillar and ground truth, tells us is the church because we have the authority of God guaranteeing that. So the question now comes down, we have today's Vatican. Of course, I, I object to the word, I mean, the word Vatican is a valid word, don't get me wrong, but it, not everything that everybody, I am also speak from the Vatican. I, after all, walked in there. I, I, I used to actually do some work in the Vatican. Nothing, nothing great. No mm -hmm. one would consider me a Vatican official, but I could say, well, I'm from the Vatican, so everything I say, actually, I'm telling more truth than the Vatican. But my <laughs> point being is that the Vatican is a, is a cover-all umbrella term. Sure. So yeah. the point is that, for example, when they talked about, you notice that, the Pope never got involved, other than writing a letter to Sister Lucy saying, I'm sending Archbishop, then Archbishop Bertoni to you. He wrote the letter, we have a signature on the letter, I trust the letter. All it says is, he's gonna ask you some questions. Here's, here's his author, here's the- uh, Here's the his, authorization, the authorization. Yeah. yeah. Okay, fair enough, done. But that doesn't mean- This is prior to two, year 2000. You no, know, this yeah. is the year 2000. This is the year 2000, okay. But, but his, prior to the announcement, okay? Right, okay. So, he wrote a letter on April 27th, if I got the right date, 20 day, 15 days or 20 days before the announcement of May 13th, uh, two months before the, uh, the June 26th announcement. But in the announcement, even the announcement of May 13th, who announces it? Cardinal Sedano. Not the Pope. So the Pope says not a word. When they give this press conference, where's John Paul II? Nowhere to be seen. So the Pope himself is careful enough not to involve himself in it. Now, had he wanted to, he could have said, I'll be there, I'll make this announcement, I'll do this. He could have, had he wanted to. He didn't want to. So, that's, some people in the Vatican saying these things, but it's not John Paul II saying them, okay? Now, I'm not saying everything John Paul II said was correct, mm -hmm. and, but in this case, this example, he's not to be seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was seen on the stage, on the, uh, you know, up at the, in, in, Saint P in Fatima, when Sudana made this, he said, I'm speaking in the name of the Holy Father, it will be announced. Okay, but, Okay. So when I read, after time I read whatever comes from the Vatican, I'm, I'm first of all looking for the authority and who's saying this and how does this check against what the church has always taught? That's, that's almost subconscious to me. So I mean, when I read encyclicals, unfortunately there are encyclicals that say things which are really contrary to the modern faith. Modern encyclicals. Yeah, modern encyclicals. I'm thinking of John Paul II writing about something about, uh, I forget what it was, on missions or on something missions, like that. Yes. And I, I read the first 10 paragraphs, it was beautiful. That was paragraph contradicts it all. I said, and I may have the wrong number, but it was at the very beginning, but the first 10, first few paragraphs were great. But then after that, he contradicts what the church always said. I said, that's it, I don't need that. And I don't, you know, so, because how do I know, what can I trust? Don't trust that, because he's already contradicting what the church has always taught. Well, this is the interesting point that we're ha where we are, where Catholics who are concerned, yeah. they have to know their faith ahead of time. Yes. Uh, the days for us just relying on whatever comes from Rome, being safe, Catholic, authentic, yeah. th those, those days uh, are, have been eclipsed yeah. by this new orientation. Yeah. And so um, it, it, in a certain sense it leaves, it leaves Catholics orphaned, but it also leaves them fending for themselves. Well, so they have to know what sources to go to so that they know their faith ahead of time. Well, I, see, I think this is where that's why, to me, the secret of Fatima is so important for the people today. Because, you know, I mean, I've spent uh, somewhere over 10 years in university studying matters of the faith, 
between my philosophy and theology and my pre-training, but most people haven't had that opportunity. So, uh, but, so I have an instinct, and not that they w couldn't even have a better one than I do. Part of that instinct is actually from prayer. That is, as uh, there's some, some modern writer before the council who talked about the census fidelium. It's really a combination of the two gifts of the Holy Spirit, the knowledge and understanding. Mm -hmm. And so when you, and the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, unlike the virtues, the gifts are a little different. The gifts are something that the Holy Spirit blows. It's like if you take a sailboat, a sailboat can go somewhere, but not without any wind. And the gifts are the sails that catch the wind when it blows. So when the Holy Spirit blows on your gifts, if, you're, if you have your sails trimmed, you'll get that. Mm -hmm. so that's why it's important for you to be uh, prepared by prayer and uh, practice in the state of grace. In the state of grace and, 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 and continue doing your practice of prayer at least, I mean, no, I say certainly for a layperson, at least five decades of the rosary. But so my point is that with that sense of, of the faithful, and it's more developed in those people who are more prayerful, then they have a sense that, yeah, this is Catholic and this is not. And, and also, I, Catholics need to pay attention to that little voice that says something seems wrong. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, I've told the story uh, in, in public that, you know, I, that, uh, I never, when I was young, when the new mass came in, I would have been about 12 or 13 when it came in, there was something about it that didn't, <clears throat> didn't ring true, but I could never tell you what it was. Sure. Uh, the, the sense I had was, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how to tune a piano, but I know that piano is out of tune. Yes. And just to say to, to say to the people, pay attention to that. Yes. Pay attention to that sense, because if you have that sense that something is wrong, 99% of the times now, there yeah. is something wrong. Well, I, I remember my experience when I was, I came back from, I, was, I had been in pilgrimage, you might say, in Europe. I came back in 68, I think it was, or 69. And for the first time in my life, I saw communion in the hand in Canada. I don't know if I've seen it anywhere else, but I couldn't believe my eyes. Yep. So, I, you know, I actually positioned my, I got into a chair, in the pew, I went closer and I looked and I wanted to make this sure this can't be happening. This can't be happening. Yeah, can't be for real, but yeah. but <laughs> yeah. it was happening. But you know, but I, I, I think it took me three or four times to find it is what you see is really happening. I could hardly be, but I knew something was entirely wrong with that. Now, I, now here, you know, even in the seventies, even after I'm ordained, I'm asking people to chancery office for how is this permitted? Oh, it's permitted by the Vatican, permitted by Rome. I said, well, you show me the document. Said, no, no, I can't do that. So I finally on my own. You know, when I went to Rome in 1981, I made up my business to go to a library, and I, sure enough, I, with a little bit of inquiry, I could find it. I found it actually in the Alphonsianum Library, and it was a letter from 1969. 69. It was part of the. It was a supplement letter, part of the. It was a PS to the document on Mysterium to the bishops. It was the, only, that, the rest was written in Latin. This was written in French. And I read this, I published it and translated it, and you've heard me say it, but I instinctively knew something. It, it, there's no blanket permission for communion in the hand. It is still against the law to this day. Most people, most priests, even most cardinals don't know that. But it's still the law, what I'm saying. I could explain it another time, but the point is, it was that little instinct you're telling me about. Yep, yeah, uh, pay attention to that. Yeah. Pay attention, if it doesn't seem right, you know, it's the type of thing that, that you, you feel on the hair yeah. on your arm. Yeah. You know, something's wrong, yeah. and... Um, and as far, you know, and but the point is people have to learn the faith themselves. Yes. Now. Very much so through the Catechism of the Council of Trent, yes. through reading the pre-Vatican II encyclicals. It can, be, it can be hard for some people, but the old Baltimore catechisms, yes. uh, all of that, uh, what was always taught throughout the centuries, yes. we arm ourselves with that. And in a certain sense, um, you know, what's coming down the pike now is not, we, we don't even have to listen to it really yeah. because yeah. No, I, they, they can't say anything new or different. No. No, I mean, I, I mean, as I say, with that encyclical, I was very beautifully done for the first 10 paragraphs or whatever it was. But when it came to saying, we don't need missions or you can be saved outside the church or whatever the hanging said, I just knew it. it's, 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 it's not Catholic. So, I mean, I just put it aside. I mean, I mean, and if it was my job, I know you read this stuff, John, because you publish a paper and you have to answer this stuff. And I, I mean, if I, had, if I had more time, I, I think I know other books I'd rather read first, but I mean, I, but I don't have to deal with it. So, but when I, I do, it's not like I'm completely ignorant of some of these things, so I do have to read some stuff mm -hmm. and, I, and I read it, but you're sort of holding your nose all the way through it, you know, just because you know it's, it's poisonous in some way. So, uh, so the answer is really, uh, you know, what I think too, just to, to close this here, I don't want this to go much longer, but we have to step back 
and, and look at the unusual historic context that we're in, yes. that the Pope speaks and we hear it immediately. Uh, the Vatican and, uh, releases a, a document and, and we get it within hours, especially by means of the internet. This is, for the vast, vast history of the church, this is unheard of. That's one thing People were not relying on every theory thing from the Vatican yeah. in order to live and know their faith. They knew it themselves at home yeah. because they learned from the true catechisms, yeah. and that's what people should return to rather well, than. Well, the second paying, thing you know, was very novel about our time, besides the technology, which you could point, but the second thing is we are living in a time that of apostasy. Now, is that my opinion? Not is it my only opinion? John Paul II says it's the time of apostasy. Pope Benedict says it's the time of apostasy. So what's apostasy? We have apostasy is a falling away from the faith in morals and doctrine by the former faithful. And so and this this is Christian Singapore. So we're in a unique time yes. in church history yeah. that we're living. We have when you have Cardinal Chappie saying that the secret, which refers to our time, we're living in the secret now, and he says it's that the apostasy comes from the top. I mean, then you've got to be on your guard. Yep. Because you fall into these people, you follow these people and, and, and into apostasy if you follow them. So you have to be on your guard. So when the Pope pronounces infallibly, and as, as Sister Lucy points out, a Pope was legitimately elected, canonically elected, which is a whole other subject. When that kind of Pope defines something, that's one thing. But if he says something which is contrary to what the faith has always taught, you ignore it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you should resist it and you should tell other people not to pay attention to it. And that's St. Robert Bellarmine and St. St. Thomas and Suarez and other great theologians mm -hmm. telling us that. And it's a great doctrine of the church. So, so th this time is unusual also in, in the moment of history in the church that we're at. So basically, um, yeah, it's a terrible thing to say. When can I trust them? Well, what happens when you're, when you're dealing with someone where there is a broken trust? Yeah. There's a certain sense that you, you can't really trust them anymore. Yeah. You'd like to. So that's why I say I, we, we... Well, the answer to that is we, so compare it to whatever else the church has compare, always taught. Yeah, learn to what the church always taught and stick to that and make that an inflexible barometer. Yeah. So anyway, so anyway, we're a little bit over time. That's all for now. And we will see you on the next broadcast. Thank you.